Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Sheila de Valera. I've served as a member of the Irish Parliament and the Irish Cabinet, and also I've been a member of the European Parliament. But it is in my capacity as a fellow of the Institute of Politics that I welcome you all here this evening. And indeed, I have very great pleasure in welcoming you to the Institute uh, of Politics, which, of course, is at the Kennedy School of Government. And as most of you will know, um, the IOP was established in 1966 to inspire and indeed encourage young people to enter career in government and public service and to serve as a bridge between academia and the practical political world. The John F. Kennedy Junior Forum in Har is Harvard's premier arena for politics, speech, discourse, discussion and debate. The most unique and important feature of the forum is the requirement for all our guests to participate in a question and answer session. Something I know that tonight's guest is looking forward to because I know him well enough to know that he likes uh, that opportunity to interact. Arthi Shook, uh, the Irish Prime Minister, uh, and I have known each other for over 30 years as we entered the Irish Parliament um, uh, at the same day in 1977. And I can attest to his phenomenal hard work on behalf of the Irish people in terms of peace and economic prosperity. You're retiring Thishuk on the 6th of May, but I cannot think of a better finale than your address to Congress yesterday and your attendance here in the forum tonight. I now want to turn to Professor Beth Simmons, the director of the Weatherhead Centre for International Affairs, our co-sponsor for this evening. Professor Simmons is also the Clarence Dillon Professor of International Affairs in the Department of Government at Harvard. Her fields of interest and core subjects are international relations, international political economy, and international law. Her current research focuses on uh, effects of international law and institutions on state behavior and policy choice. Her publications include Who Adjusts? Domestic Sources of, of Foreign Economic Policy During the Interwar Years of 1923 to 1939, uh, which was a winner of the 1995 American Political Science Association Woodrow Wilson Award. She has also published articles on international instit uh, institutions and international organization and world politics. So I now have the great pleasure in calling on Professor Simmons to make the official uh, announcement and indeed introduction to the Taoiseach, Mr. Bertie Ahern. <laughs> Professor. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2008 Samuel L. and Elizabeth Jodidi Lecture. The Jodidi Lecture is amongst the most prominent of lectures series that the Weatherhead Center sponsors, and perhaps one of the most distinguished here at Harvard University. Established in 1955, the lecture provides for, quote, delivery of lectures by eminent and well-qualified persons for the promotion of tolerance, understanding, and goodwill among nations and the peace of the world. And past speakers have included heads of state, prominent members of government from around the world, and scholars of international renown. Today's speaker is a most welcome addition to this long line of notable individuals. Patrick Bartholomew Bertie Ahern was elected to be the 10th Taoiseach, or for those of you who might not understand my Irish Gaelic uh, prime minister, of Ireland and presides over a coalition government led by Fianna Fáil, the Fianna Fáil party. Prime Minister Ahern has been a Chaktadala or delegate to the lower chamber of parliament since 1977, as Sheila was indicating. He represents the constituency of Dublin Central. He has also served in a number of governments, that of Charles Hoy as the Minister of Labor from 1987 to 1991, and uh, under Albert Reynolds as Minister for Finance, 1991 to 1994. In 1994, Bertie Ahern succeeded Albert Reynolds 
as the sixth leader of the Fianna Fall party and the first unopposed candidate since 1959. Following the general election of 1997, Prime Minister Ahern became the youngest ever Taoiseach and is now con uh, concluding his third term. Prime Minister Ahern's achievements in government have been remarkable, and I will only be able to name just the highlights this evening. Of course, perhaps his greatest achievement has been his work towards peace in Northern Ireland. During the first six months of his term, Prime Minister Ahern oversaw the renewal of the provisional IRA ceasefire, which paved the way for resumed negotiations in Northern Ireland and resulted in the Good Friday Agreement of April 10th 1998, almost exactly 10 years ago. And upon the conclusion of that historic agreement, his words, in his own words, he declared, a line can be drawn under the bloody past, and I think he has not been proven wrong. Embodying much of what this Joe Didi lecture is uh, to embody, the agreement involved the British and the Irish governments, most of Northern Ireland's political parties, as well as the people of Northern Ireland and the Republic, and laid out an exclusively peaceful and democratic framework for power sharing. Of course, the Good Friday Agreement was much larger than any one individual, but the gentleman with whom I'm sharing this stage this evening played a crucial role in launching a stable peace for his country. The area of prosperity, of course, has been one of his major areas of accomplishment as well. During his term as Prime Minister, Ireland experienced a boom in which it was transformed from one of Europe's poorer countries into one of its wealthiest. During this period, Irish living standards rose dramatically to equal those of the wealthiest nations of Europe. As in all countries that have experienced rapid growth, the economic boom in Ireland has not been without some controversy, and yet Ireland remains one of the truly remarkable development stories of contemporary Europe. And finally, in the area of European unification and European cooperation. In the first half of 2004, Prime Minister Ahern served as the president of the European Council, and during his time in that position, European Union leaders agreed to the European Constitution, although, of course, as we know, popular uh, opposition proved to be a setback. And on May 1st, 2004, that would be exactly four years ago, the European Union formally admitted 10 new members uh, while he was acting as president. The union expanded from 15 to 25 members, the largest single expansion in its history. Its population jumped from 381 million to 456 million. And with, with Prime Minister Ahern as its president, in June of 2004, the European Union held the largest transnational election in history. Now, as you are all doubtless well aware, political careers take unpredictable twists and turns, and no leader of any consequence has ever been able to rise above criticism entirely. Our 2008 Jodidi lecturer in fact, is with us unexpectedly during the final week of his third term as Taoiseach. But these remarkable strands of accomplishment, peace, prosperity, European Union and development, will always be his positive legacy. We're exceedingly grateful to hear his views on Ireland and the European Union, promoting peace and prosperity at home and abroad. Please welcome Taoiseach Bertie Ahern. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Beth Simmons, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, remarks, and uh, thank you, uh, Sheila de Valera, for my colleague, um, for uh, the opportunity uh, of being of with you. Um, I, I want to thank you all for uh, coming along. I want to thank you all for the opportunity of, of addressing you. It's uh, my second time to be um, in, in Harvard, and uh, it's a great honor to be here, a great honor to be in the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. A great honor to be uh, asked uh, to give uh, this 
Judy uh, lecture, and I appreciate that. And to the distinguished members uh, of the Harvard faculty, the, uh, the Harvard student body, and the staff, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like first of all to, to thank the president of Harvard University, uh, Drew Gilpin Faust, for inviting me to be here uh, this evening to uh, address this ga gathering, and to uh, Sheila De Valera, a friend and colleague, and former member of my government, for um, her kind remarks, and uh, also to helping uh, this uh, day to happen. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Beth Simmons, director of the Weatherhead Centre for International Affairs, and Dean Elwood for the opportunity uh, to address you uh, this evening. Uh, I recognise, ladies and gentlemen, that this uh, forum is a leading uh, arena for informed discussion uh, on key uh, public policy issues, and uh, the Joey uh, lecture has established a highlight, uh, as been said uh, by Beth, the promotion of tolerance, uh, understanding, and uh, goodwill among nations, and the, the peace of the world. And in keeping with the, the legacy of President Kennedy, and indeed uh, his son, John F. Kennedy Jr., uh, these issues are also central to the uh, work uh, that has been carried out here at the John F. Kennedy School of Government and the Institute of Politics. I'm very proud to be able to contribute uh, to this important uh, ongoing discussion. And uh, when I stood in the auditorium here in this great college uh, uh, six years ago, I spoke uh, to you in some detail about our efforts to pursue peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, as been said by the professor just 10 years ago, marked a, a watershed in our a history. And it marked a new beginning uh, for Northern Ireland and for the, the islands of, of Ireland. And it was our framework for a, a better future, a framework for a, a peaceful and a lasting political settlement. And it created an inclusive, uh, power-sharing institutions of government in Northern Ireland. And it transformed the uh, relations uh, between North and South and the island of Ireland uh, and between Britain and Ireland. At the time, we all recognised that it was a built on a difficult compromises, as any agreement is, and hard choices for, had to be made by uh, all parties, including the governments. And it involved a massive change of political structures, of mindsets, especially for the people in Northern Ireland. It is not surprising uh, that full implementation of the agreement was a, a long and arduous and a difficult task. Throughout it all, Prime Minister Blair and I, supported by our friends uh, in America, and never ceased in our efforts to push forward, or forward progress, uh, sometimes slow, uh, sometimes quite speedy, uh, sometimes going in reverse. Uh, none of that, I suppose, is unusual in a complex agreement. I pay tribute to the political leaders of all of the parties in Northern Ireland who have brought their parties with them in acceptance uh, of difficult but necessary accommodations and uh, compromises. I pay tribute also to the men and women of Northern Ireland who work quietly and tirelessly uh, to build peace and reconciliation in their neighbourhoods, in their towns and in their villages. And without this change at community level, the uh, political settlement uh, that we created would not have been built on sound foundations. Uh, the last year has been one of historic progress and achievement in Northern Ireland. Uh, on the 8th of May of last year, almost a year ago, Dr. Dean Paisley of the Democratic Unionist Party and Martin McGuinness of Sinn Féin uh, took office as First Minister and Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. Since then, they've led an effective uh, power-sharing executive, making uh, important decisions uh, for the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, two months later, I was privileged to uh, lead the ministers of the Irish government to the first meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council uh, under the uh, new Northern Ireland executive. And at that meeting, and in subsequent meetings over the year, uh, we took forward initiatives on roads investments, on innovation, on energy supply, which are delivering uh, real practical help and benefits to the people of Northern Ireland. On the 11th of May last year, I welcomed First Minister Paisley to the Battle of the Boyne site, a true symbol of uh, reconciliation between the two communities on the island, uh, on the site of one of the most divisive and uh, contentious battles in our history. And one of my last acts before leaving office will be to welcome First Minister Paisley there again to officially open uh, the battle site visitor centre uh, and many of the new structures that will be there uh, for a new generation uh, to see it in peace and harmony. Yesterday, I was proud to address the Joint Houses of Congress and had the honour to tell them that uh, Ireland is now at peace. It is a different place. Things have moved on. And 
uh, we will not be back into the difficult times again, and I think that is the view of us all. Uh, the European Union has provided very strong and uh, moral support to Northern Ireland and to the border counties over the past uh, two decades, and has now entered a, a new phase of engagement in light of the uh, positive developments in Northern Ireland. And the European Union has provided a, a new context in the historic developments in Northern Ireland, and we're all very grateful for uh, the role that the European Union has played. President John F. Kennedy, during his historic visit to Ireland in the summer of 1963, described Ireland as a Nile of destiny, and he predicted that when our hour has come, we will have something to give to the world. That was his quote. A 35 years of European involvement has been a, a powerful force of causing Ireland's hour to come in a manner that could scarcely have been imagined by uh, past generations. Uh, the facts of Ireland's advancement as a member of the European Union uh, speaks for themselves. We have progressed from being one of the, the least developed uh, Western European countries in the 1970s uh, to one of the most successful today. Uh, my generation has been a particular beneficiary of these changes. We have lived our lives in an Ireland of, of hope and expectation. Uh, these advances are clearly the product of various influences. It's, I think, very evident, for example, uh, that our special ties with the uh, United States have played an indispensable role in our emergence as a, a leading edge knowledge intensive economy. And while Europe has clearly been a vital catalyst for us, uh, I have never seen our membership in uh, purely economic terms. Uh, people outside of Ireland often ask, why is it a country that struggled so long uh, to assert our independence? Uh, we are such enthusiastic supporters uh, of European integration. And these attitudes, I think, are uh, a byproduct of our national experience. Uh, we have a very proud tradition of active engagement in international affairs. We're uh, deeply committed the last half century to the United Nations. We have a distinguished record of service and peacekeeping operations uh, stretching back uh, those 50 years. We attach considerable priority to the uh, promotion and the protection of human rights and are determined to continue speaking on behalf of those uh, who face political oppression around the world, no uh, matter where they are. In recent years, the economic advances that we have made as a small country have enabled us to increase our commitment to international development. We have a, a steady expansion of our official overseas development assistance, which this year will reach at one point at $5 billion. And it was a privilege for me to be able to announce at the General Assembly in September 2005 that our, our national commitment to achieving at the UN target of 0.7% of GDP uh, would be reached uh, by four years' time, by 2012. And we're well uh, and up to our target on that. Our own history has, ladies and gentlemen, I think given us a, a genuine understanding uh, of the challenges facing developing countries and a determination to play uh, our part in the battle against poverty and disease in the developing world. In more than two decades of involvement in uh, European affairs, I've become a, a passionate uh, believer in the value of Europeans working intensely together uh, to address the shared problems, to harness our shared opportunities. I'm now more convinced uh, than ever before that uh, Ireland uh, can achieve far more in partnership with our neighbours uh, than we could ever have done on our own. Uh, the Union's record and the great work of the European Union for uh, these decades is the promotion of peace, and it is a formidable one. At the macro level, of course, European integration has served uh, to heal the wounds of the past. Uh, the European Union is, I believe, entering into a new and exciting stage uh, in its evolution. Uh, last year witnessed two uh, significant milestones in uh, Europe's history. Uh, first in March, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of European Union's uh, founding document, the Treaty of Rome. Then in October, we agreed the terms of a reform treaty uh, aimed at giving Europe the capacity to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, the agreement was modelled on the uh, EU constitutional treaty and uh, negotiated uh, under Ireland's auspices in 2004. But of course, uh, after the votes in the Netherlands and France, we had to go into a period of reflection. Uh, and uh, as is all great agreements, um, we changed the name, uh, took out a few sections of it, uh, turned it around a bit, 
uh, and then called it the Reform Treaty. Uh, perhaps the main reason for uh, this European Treaty is the desire for a more uh, cohesive uh, Europe and a cohesive uh, role for Europe in, in world affairs. Uh, for all of Europe's advances in uh, promoting economic integration, the achievement of a, a single market and the a successful launch of the uh, single currency, the euro, our international voices remained uh, relatively muted. Uh, the new European Treaty attempts to, to rectify uh, this deficit. Uh, the Union has always acted as a, a beacon, uh, demonstrating that success uh, cannot be achieved by a voluntary community of states uh, pledged to act in cooperation and in common interest uh, while respecting their uh, diversity. The crisis in the Balkans in the 1990s uh, taught Europe a sad uh, and a very costly lesson. This became the catalyst for the uh, development of a more meaningful external role uh, for the Union. Uh, we came to realise that United Europe view could only uh, carry infinitely more weight uh, than individual states uh, acting on their own. And the development of the common foreign and security policy, uh, as you know, has uh, provided the European Union with a, an enhanced capacity uh, to respond uh, coherently uh, to international developments and to crisis situations. Uh, the European Union is currently in the process of deploying uh, a significant rule of law mission to Kosovo, uh, which will help that new state establish durable institutions and ensure respect uh, for human rights. Similarly, the, the European Union has since 2004 uh, provided a, a military stabilization force in Bosnia-Herzegovina under UN mandate to contribute to the maintenance of a safe and secure environment in that country. Indeed, on foot of the success of the Northern Ireland peace process, we have decided to try to capture uh, some of the, the key lessons of, of the process and to seek where appropriate, where appropriate being the operative words, is to share uh, some of these lessons with others struggling to overcome, to overcome conflict situations. Uh, Europe has arrived at a time uh, of decision, of course, about its future, and an important part of the decision will be taken in Ireland on the 12th of June. And next month, we will hold a, a referendum on the uh, Lisbon Reform uh, Treaty. Um, we're the only country of the uh, 27 that are having a referendum. I'll explain that later if you wish. Uh, after uh, years of internal debate about the proper functioning of our union of 27, or 27 member states, it is time, in our view, to move forward and to deal actively and imaginatively with the major policy issues uh, and demand their uh, urgent attention. And we know that Europe cannot rest on its laurels. Uh, we must move forward. And uh, for many of us, this means devoting more of Europe's energies to coping with external challenges. We believe that Europe has a responsibility uh, to give a, a lead to the global community, for example, in relation to uh, tackling climate change, a great issue of our times. And it's an important priority for Ireland to ratify the Reform Treaty. Uh, we want the European Union to be able to manage the affairs effectively and to be able to play a more meaningful role in the world affairs. And as Beth has said, the European population is now at 500 million people. Uh, a significant block uh, of the world working across the 27 uh, countries and uh, working from um, the westerly point that Ireland holds right up to the uh, Russian and the uh, Ukraine border. Uh, 2009 will be a, a very important year for the European Union. It will be a, a time of change in many parts of the world. And I hope that Europe will then have a treaty in place, a treaty that will allow the institutional issues uh, to be issues of the past and to allow it to be a more dynamic organization, being able to respond to the uh, everyday issues uh, that the world and European people wanted to deal with. And this will put our house in order for the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, in our view, it will uh, put an end to institutional debate that has gone on in Europe effectively since the Maastricht Treaty, the Amsterdam Treaties, the Single European Acts um, that have gone on for the better part of, of 20 years. Uh, these new positions will give Europe a, a new profile in world affairs so that the, the values we share can be articulated more clearly. And a major priority in the years ahead will be to ensure that the European Union-US relationship continues to prosper. It's by far uh, the world's most important economic relationships. 
Uh, after a, a period of some flux, we had a, an opportunity during the Irish presidency in 2004 of being able to uh, have a very successful uh, European Union uh, US summit uh, where we were able to make practical decisions on at least six uh, major issues uh, that allowed uh, the stability of the relationship and the harmonious uh, future of the relationship to work out back in uh, Sheila de Valera's uh, native uh, county in, in Clare and her, her, her then uh, constituency. And uh, we believe that this relationship and what we started during the Irish presidency, and which has been built on since in a number of, of presidencies led by other countries, uh, has been very successful. When President Kennedy, ladies and gentlemen, came to Ireland in 1963, he had just made his famous visit to Berlin, uh, now maybe forgotten by uh, a lot of people, but um, in Ireland and uh, people of Irish descent, as many uh, of you are, but he came straight uh, from that uh, famous speech and, uh, where he called for uh, the unification and the end of the Iron Curtain, and he, he came straight to, uh, to Dublin on that occasion. And, uh, the symbolic focus of a, a divided Europe had been his, uh, his mission and his speeches on that great occasion, many of those great speeches that are here uh, and ones that uh, still, I think, to this day are uh, referred to uh, in, in speeches all over the world. Uh, Forty-five years later, uh, Germany reunited and the, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe are uh, breathing freely of what at times people thought could never uh, be possible. In the northwest corner of Europe, Ireland is putting its uh, terrible conflict uh, behind. Uh, the United States, as we all appreciate, has played a, an indispensable role in all of that progress. Uh, the personal courage of people on the ground, many of whom suffered profound wrongs, has been vital. Uh, painstaking government-to-government -government work has been essential. And the European Union provided a, a crucial a context for all of this work. I can safely say that President Kennedy's words in 1963 about having something to give to the world ring true today, as Ireland and the European Union strive to promote peace and prosperity at home and abroad. Uh, these are vital issues for us and uh, vital issues for Europe. Uh, I think the changes that have, have happened have uh, been enormous. I think the uh, profound uh, lessons from uh, the conflict, the division, uh, the wars, uh, two world wars in a century, uh, wars for generations and conflict for generations, have now changed. Uh, Europe is a peaceful place, it's a stable place, uh, it is a united place. Uh, the progress perhaps sometimes is slow, perhaps sometimes it's bureaucratic, uh, but there's no doubting uh, that it is a, a place of, of world stability. Its relationships now with the rest of the world, every uh, year there's a summit between the uh, European Union uh, United States, between the uh, European Union uh, and Canada, uh, between the Latin American Caribbean states and Europe, between uh, Africa uh, and Europe. Uh, they're not quite as frequent. frequent. I've been lucky enough to attend the last two, uh, one last year and the other one eight years earlier. Took a little bit of time to get around to the second one, but uh, most of them have been a, a really a dramatic and changing and bringing things on. And uh, I think it is uh, crucially important that when we uh, look at the, uh, the wide world today and we look at uh, what has been achieved in the world, uh, that for us who are Europeans, for those of us who are Irish and who've lived in conflict situations for uh, all of our, our history, for hundreds of years of it, I uh, can see that uh, the European Union is promoting peace, uh, it is promoting prosperity, it is giving a, a whole new life to its citizens, it's giving a whole new meaning uh, to what the principles of this uh, lecture and this series of lectures for the last 50 years have been about. And for us as a, a, a small country playing a part and an equal part in the European Union, this has made a profound change uh, for the citizens of the country that I'm honoured to represent. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to proceed to the question and answer period. And uh, we only have three rules about the questions and answers. One is you should identify yourself and your affiliation. No need to give your entire resume, just your affiliation and name would be fine. The second is you should ask one question. And the third is you should ask one question. 
Okay, so if you can, uh, if you, the best way to get an answer is to ask a question. So um, we have four microphones placed around the room, and uh, we'll proceed by there's one, two, three, four, and uh, I'll ask those who have questions to proceed to the microform, uh, fo uh, microphones, form a queue, and then I'm going to uh, go in a circle, uh, whichever way the lines begin to form, but I'll be basically proceeding in a circle around with the microphones. So, uh, please begin over here on the left. Uh, Mr. Tishik, thanks for coming. My name is Cody Keenan, I'm a second year student at the Kennedy School. And like 30 million other Americans, my family came over in the 1800s, and we'd like to move back, we just can't afford it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when the American press lately covers your economic surge, uh, they actually, they usually throw in a lot of the pub closures all over Ireland. And while that's not really my question, as a, as a tourist I'm concerned about it, but I think it begs a larger question, how do you harness economic growth like that without losing the best of your past with handling increased immigration and the problems that come with that? You know, how do you, how do you harness economic growth without, while dealing with the things that come with it? Well, uh, there's a song in, in Dublin, in, in my own area in Dublin, I'm a, I'm a confirmed dub, as most people here know, even though my parents are from Cork, a uh, bit of a contradiction. <laughs> and it, it, it is that um, a song about Dublin in the rare old times, and um, it's a lovely song to listen to about it, unless you lived in the areas that it's talking about, um, the areas that lived in squalor and tenements and, and jobless and no future. Um, so um, I, I, I never believe that these great times of the past um, uh, when people uh, lived with their donkeys and carts was, was a good time. Um, that image of Ireland is a, uh, an image uh, that um, uh, I don't feel any nostalgic about and holding on to about it. Uh, I think it's very interesting to read in, in history books, but that's where it should be. Uh, what we have done uh, is, is turn Ireland into a, uh, a, a, an economy that hasn't lost its agricultural base. We used to be 40% GDP um, for agriculture one time. Now agricultural output is 2%. 4% uh, of the, uh, the world's services uh, is, is from Ireland. We're a small country, but 4% of the entire global services um, comes from Ireland. Uh, we have 19 of the top 20 pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies. We have all, nearly all the ICT companies uh, worthy of the name um, uh, that are in Ireland. Uh, and, and we're building the economy uh, on, on high-tech, um, ICT, pharmaceuticals, medical appliance, and medical industry. And it's the only way to do it for us. If you're a small country uh, that wants to keep your workforce at home, we had hundreds of years. Um, we had 10 million people one time. Um, the famine sorted that out. Uh, we ended up at one stage only having 2.6 million. So to answer your question, uh, the only way for us in a westerly country and the side of Europe uh, to, to su sort of survive is to have high growth, in, in high intensive industries. Um, and you, you do hold uh, onto uh, your, your past in new ways. I mean, Irish arts and culture and song and dance are stronger than ever. Um, one of the opening sessions of the Beijing Olympics is river dance. Um, we would have never got into the Olympics 100 years ago. Um, so uh, uh, we, we used to win a few medals on strong men, uh, but now we win it on, on classy acts. So I, I think it, 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 you, know, you, you can't have a boat ways. You can't be a modern country, um, and you can't be an old-fashioned place. Ireland today is a, mod, a, a model modern country, and that's what we want it to be. I'm uh, Daniel Koss, I'm a student here at the, at the Kennedy School, and um, I'm, uh, we are seeing the European Union getting very engaged in Africa, uh, sending troops to Chad, for example, but also to Congo, um, and of course, there are many crises in Africa, and I would like to ask you, um, why Chad, why not Somalia? How do you set your priorities? I mean, as humanitarian missions, um, where do you go, where do you not go? I mean, yeah. Well, in Ireland, we will only involve ourselves and participate um, in missions that are human in mandated and are based on Petersburg task. Um, uh, and that is on the Petersburg task strictly for us because we must get a mandate from our parliament, from our government, uh, and to do that, uh, we can only do it on Petersburg task, which is a humanitarian grounds. Um, 
we're involved in Chad, it's an Irish member, um, Brigadier Ash, who is the leading uh, the, uh, the mission in Chad. Uh, and that is because there's hundreds of thousands of people coming through from Chad and Darfur. Uh, and our involvement there is, is, is trying to, uh, to help the plight uh, of those people. It is a small European mission. Uh, the people there are crying out, our foreign minister there was there recently, uh, they're crying out for assistance and help. Um, there's a half a dozen civil wars, as you know, uh, and conflicts in Africa. Uh, for, for us and I think for Europe, but we can, we can only uh, pick uh, very limited missions. And there's even a lot of debate and a, a fair amount of anxiety, I'd have to say, uh, around the, the Chad mission. Um, but for, for us, uh, it, it completely fulfills the kind of a mandate that we can have and, and helping uh, people who are really being tortured uh, by the struggles in that country. I suppose it is a fair question to ask this. How will you get into a mission like that? How will you get out of it? That happened in Lebanon for us. We spent 23 years on the, uh, the Syrian borders. Uh, I think it's going to be a difficult mission for the European Union of when uh, we can come out. You cannot go to a place like Chad and say it's six months and it'll all be right. It will not be. In, in my view, uh, how long Ireland stay there will be a matter for uh, the Irish government's the future. Uh, but for Europe, I think it will be a very difficult decision um, uh, to, to come out of a mission like that uh, in, in, in the short to medium term. And from my penny's worth, I do not think that would be possible. Hi, I'm Anna Gressel-Bacher, and I'm a visiting fellow in the history department working on U.S. involvement in Northern Ireland. And so I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on the shape of U.S. involvement you'd like to see in the coming years. I, I, the, the shape of the process going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I think the, 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 big, the big issue now is uh, stability, stability for the economy in Northern Ireland to, to generate more investment. Next week, the Northern Ireland Executive are, are running an investment conference. There's an enormous amount of companies from the United States and, and uh, other parts, but mainly the United States, coming to Northern Ireland. And I think for the project to work, uh, the, its ability to, to create investment, employment and stability uh, will best be shown by uh, how the economy of, of the North works. We'll play our part from uh, the South uh, with, without interfering and only doing things in total agreement uh, with, with the executive. Um, but if you ask me in 10 years on, it's 10 years since the Good Friday Agreement, I would like to see Northern Ireland being a place where it is very attractive uh, for investment, uh, where uh, jobs are, are plentiful, uh, where we have uh, better relationships north and south, but in no way uh, interfering, uh, just cooperating in, in economic and, and, and social sense. And that pe more and more people who left Northern Ireland uh, over the last 20, 20 years or so, uh, young people who left during the Troubles, will come back and work in that area. And I think all that is extremely doable. Uh, there is no reason uh, why it will not be an economic success story, a tourism success story, uh, and that the relationship between uh, North and South will not thrive on. Um, there is a, one difficulty about policing that has, still has to be resolved, um, but I suspect that that will be successfully done somewhere uh, during 2008. Um, it was to be finished by the 1st of May. That's obviously not possible, um, but hopefully that will happen very soon. Yes. Hello, my name is Mark. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, some Irish people, as a matter of fact, uh, an organization by the name of We Are Change. Um, on the 13th of December 2007, you signed your name to the Lisbon Treaty. Irish history is blooming with people who have fought and died for our country's independence, and given that this treaty effectively means the end of Ireland's independence and sovereignty, why do you so easily sign this treaty, especially seeing as it's binding and you basically can't get out of it? And have you made any effort to uh, make a, uh, um, the document uh, readable to the Irish people in a fashion uh, that would be uh, easily understood? Well, if I can say a, 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 a few things about that. Um, I'm totally pro-European. Uh, I was involved in negotiating most of, of the document. It, it did change. They took out some of the, the trappings of a constitutional treaty, um, and they made some changes on the, uh, the substance of the treaty, so it hasn't changed uh, much uh, from the, the agreement that, that, that I uh, concluded back in, in June 2004. 
Uh, so obviously I'm totally in favor of it. Um, it all this that happens in Europe um, from a, a country's point of view is you pool some of your sovereignty. You don't lose your sovereignty. Uh, if you want uh, things to happen uh, in a, a coherent, uh, inclusive way, you pool your sovereignty. Uh, to be afraid to do that, uh, uh, to, be, to be afraid to make uh, moves forwards, to, to work with others, uh, to make for a, a better world and a better continent, um, in, in my view, is foolish. Uh, you can uh, whistle out in the dark uh, and hold on to nostalgic things, as I said earlier on. Or, or you can be at the center trying to make uh, your country a better country. And, and it, it is my passionate belief uh, that the best thing for the Irish people is to be at the center and heart of things. And nobody cared uh, about Ireland or cared for Ireland uh, when we were an individual, sovereign, independent uh, republic, um, when we had nobody to sell our goods for. Uh, we export uh, practically 90% of everything that we make and produce. Uh, 90%. Uh, so it would be a great setup for a country. Uh, and I understand that I'm not having a go at you, but I, it, it's a, I, the view behind it is from the no side. Uh, and I just think they're wrong. They were always wrong. Uh, they were wrong. They, they, they said in 1973, if we joined into Europe, uh, that Ireland would go backwards. Uh, we, we had 20% unemployment then. All of our young people were coming to the United States. Uh, they said in the 80s um, that we would lose all our power. Ireland has more power today. Um, when I go to the table in the European Council to fight for my country, I can get equal time uh, with, with the German Chancellor or the French President. Um, I, I can, uh, I, I'm there as one person from four and a quarter million people. Uh, they can be there representing 80 and 90 people. And, and to be away from that, uh, to, to, to pull yourself away from that, would be the greatest act of lunacy and insanity that ever any political leader would do. Hi, Taoiseach. My name is Stephen Donnelly. I'm studying international development here at the Kennedy School. And I'd love to get your thoughts on what you think Ireland, as a very small country, uh, can do to use its particular assets and identity to help uh, developing countries in Africa and other regions around the world. Well, I think we can play a huge part. It, it, we, we've been lucky as a small country um, to have so many people who have been involved in missionary work um, in older days and maybe to a lesser extent nowadays. It's, it's not religious, it's lay work, and, and the same passion is in Ireland. Um, men and women, uh, young and old and middle ages, uh, go to uh, Africa uh, and they work on projects, many of them craftspeople. Uh, we're in South Africa in the townships where um, hundreds of Irish uh, people go every year and uh, in, involved in the Nile Melling Trust. Uh, there's uh, many uh, others, Tracy Pickett brings sports people there, and they're, and they're all in, involved in, in doing lay missionary work today. And uh, I, I think what's been innately in the Irish psychic about this is because we suffered a famine, because we, we suffered its devastation, uh, because we were poor for most of the centuries, because we conflict for practically 800 uh, years. Um, Irish people understand the plight of, uh, of the less well-off, and we've always produced people uh, who have been interested in doing that. And I think that's happened, been well reflected in the work that uh, Bob Geldof uh, and Bonnell has done in the last 20 years of galvanizing the world to put pressure on world leaders. Um, and of course, we recognize you cannot play a role like that uh, unless uh, you, you um, speak by, by your own money. Uh, and if we get to 0.7, which we will, uh, because it's already in our multi-annual plan, um, but already, uh, per capita, we are the sixth highest uh, contributor in the world to overseas uh, development aid. And the great thing about development aid is uh, that, you know, small things. Uh, I, I was in Lesotho a few years ago, and we put, uh, we built bridges across the rivers. It was costing us 25,000 euros to do each bridge. Uh, and, you know, you say to yourself, well, you know, surely people would have done that before. But in one of the bridges that I was at, there had been a, a young person had been drowned practically every month for the previous 50 months, um, particularly in the, in, the bad, in the bad season. Obviously, in the dry season, it wasn't a problem. But in all of the, uh, the months where there was 
um, bad seasons. The aid centres in the mountains, uh, Irish people are up there. And for very small money, you can make a huge difference. And I think the, the work that President Clinton has done in Mozambique, uh, we have been a big part of, of the donors, the work that President Bush has done and the money that he's put into the AIDS program of malaria, uh, this is, is, is enormous. And we've played our part in that, significant in financial terms. And um, it's so, so small of money uh, you know, can do such a, a huge task. And there's nothing ultimately better than saving people's lives. And, and it's not difficult to do it if, if the world just pulls together on it. And um, that's why I think uh, overseas development is one of the big things that Irish taxpayers have been very good at doing. Hi, Taoiseach. I'm John Ryan. I'm Chief Medical Resident of Boston Medical Center. Over the last, since the economic uh, improvement in Ireland, a lot of Irish have been going back to Ireland over the last couple of years. Do you see this evolving into more of an act of recruitment rather than simply the economic prosperity acting as a lure for the Ireland to return? I think more people are, are going back, um, and that's good. Uh, I, I think you know, voluntary emigration uh, is a good thing too. I think people uh, traveling gain experience. Um, what we've always said is our campaign as a government, as a political force in the country, was to try to stop forced emigration. Uh, I think the fact that people travel and work abroad is, um, is enlightening and gives great, great experience. Uh, we'd like to continue to, to pull back as many as we can all of the time. Um, uh, when I was elected Taoiseach 11 years ago, uh, the Irish workforce, and the, the term I like to use for the non-Irish is the new Irish, because I don't like the term non-Irish, no, no, non, nothing means nothing, but not, I think new Irish means a lot. Um, it was just over 1%. Uh, today, the Irish workforce uh, is 15%. Um, so from the times that we had all the emigration, where all our young people were leaving, uh, were those famous ads, the IDA ads, you know, the best and the brightest, but they were all moving around the world. Um, uh, and I, and I, I hope that as more people go abroad, I think it's good for people to go abroad. I really think that's a, a, a good issue. It's an issue we're following with the United States administration at the moment, not the undocumented, but just to get a visa system that more young people uh, can come to the United States. At the moment, there's far more young Irish uh, going to Australia. Uh, and I think you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it would be nice if we could uh, rediscover the fact the connection of Ireland to America and more for people were coming here, even for a year or two. Um, uh, but obviously for us, if 15% of our workforce is now new Irish, uh, the more of our people we can pull back after a period abroad, that would be good for our economy. Hi, I'm Chris Trimble. I'm studying international development here at the Kennedy School and uh, from Northern Ireland. And um, one of the things I've been struck by as I travel around the world or work around the world in conflict areas is just how much of an example Northern Ireland is um, as a, being able to reach peace through uh, dialogue. Um, so, and you, you mentioned about, about that in your talk um, just this evening. Um, so I was wondering if you were able to uh, talk to us a bit more about um, where Ireland's role could be in that going forward. Um, particularly, it was something that's on our, uh, talked about a lot here this week is the Israeli-Palestine situation and the, since the, the 60 year, um, uh, there's a lot of events happening here this week in, in memory of that. So it's one of, and that's obviously where Tony Blair's big focus is now as well, which who you worked with on the, on the Good Friday Agreement. So I was wondering, is that something which you see yourself working on uh, in the future? And what are the lessons from Northern Ireland which can apply to, to Israel or, or to other parts you think might be appropriate? Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave myself out of it for the moment, <laughs> but uh, whatever happens in the future. But yes is the answer to your question, most definitely. Uh, we've set up a conflict resolution a section in our Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we've put some good people uh, and a lot of the expertise that we have uh, based on the Northern Ireland experience into it. Uh, no conflict uh, is the same, um, but there's always huge similarities. And, the obvious similarity is that there's differences and, and there's conflict and um, it is how you pull people together. So that, that similarity will always be there regardless of, 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 of what it is. Uh, we've already, uh, uh, Nulo Lone, who, who is the, uh, the former uh, police ombudsman person for Northern Ireland, she has taken our first um, mission on behalf of, of Ireland uh, in Timor-Leste. Uh, she and, and on the, uh, the, the conflicts uh, in the old Timorese and on the Indonesian uh, border, and she's playing a role there. 
Uh, we, we've already been looking a lot at, at, at the Middle East uh, issue. Um, there, there are ongoing discussions. Uh, we've had a number of groups that have come from different places. Uh, colleagues in Northern Ireland on all sides uh, have been talking to, to the Iraqis. Um, there, we have had other uh, conflict situations as well. There was been previously uh, work done um, by John Hume and speeches that had been made on the Indian uh, Pakistani situation. So I, I think there are, there are a lot of, of, of missions. And th there's simple enough lessons that I think people can give to people. We've, as you know, Irish people have been involved in the Spanish situation and tried to be helpful there. It wasn't particularly a, a success yet, but still, still hope in these issues. So uh, the conflict division in, 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 in uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs can be helpful. I wouldn't put it up in big lights. I think people can be helpful. I, I, I don't think there's any great plan that anyone can pull out and say, you know, this is a model. It's not like an economic work. It, it, it worked here, so it'll work there. Uh, that, that isn't possible. But as far as giving advice, giving experiences, uh, giving insights, uh, that is possible. Yeah. Hello, I'm Taoiseach. Uh, I'm Ryan O'Hara, uh, a student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, just down the street there. Another question about the North, I'm afraid. Um, basically, you've been talking today how, how it's, there's been great progress made and uh, things are going well so far. Um, but you've also mentioned that, you know, that I think we, we need to realise that it's still quite delicate, the situation there. And you've mentioned yourself earlier on issues such as uh, policing. I'm just wondering, is there any like personal words of advice you're going to be giving to your successor to deal with these potential sticking points? I know things are going very well at the minute, but, you know. No, they, they are sticking points. You're, you're correct, no doubt about that. Uh, the policing one uh, has to be resolved, uh, and I think it's very important that it's, it's resolved um, quickly. I don't want to start putting deadlines on it because you know that that ever works, um, and particularly in Northern Ireland. But it, it's important because it was part of the St Andrews Agreement. It was part of um, what Sinn Féin were promised, and, and it, it has to be delivered on. Uh, and the, the solution, the resolution of, of that is, is, is not difficult. It's about the, you know, the political agreements to do it. Uh, and I, th I, I would be confident, I would be very disappointed um, if the resolution that is already there uh, will, not be, will not be implemented. And on, on this one, I should say uh, that Gordon Brown, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and myself are totally in agreement. So there's no argument here with the governments. Uh, there is not a difficulty with the devolution of policing from Westminster uh, to Northern Ireland. That, 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 that does not create any obstacle for the British government uh, and no differences between us um, and the British government. So uh, I understand it has its sensitivities, but it is hugely important. Um, you, you understand on the ground uh, that in some areas criminality has stepped up that was not there in the years of the Troubles. Um, uh, the drugs issue and uh, what every city in the world is hit with um, is, is also in Northern Ireland. So the better uh, that we get a policing um, issue resolved, uh, the better. On other issues, I should just say, I, I, I put them all under that investment and jobs issue. You know, whether it is a, a Republican area, nationalist area, loyalist area, unionist area, it doesn't matter. Um, people want to see that things are better. People want to see rejuvenation, regeneration, unemployment. And I, I think the, that is all linked to the economy. Uh, and, and that is about the cooperation that we can all do together to make the economy in Northern Ireland stronger and to try and decrease the amount of public sector investment that is in the economy in Northern Ireland. I, I think these are all doable. I'm not saying any of them are easy, uh, but they're very doable. And I think the will is there by all sides to achieve them. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is David Garrity. I'm a PhD student here at Harvard. Um, my question is kind of related to the previous two. Um, as somebody who played a, a central role in bringing about peace in Northern Ireland, um, I just wanted to ask what advice you would have for the next US president in terms of dealing with the global, what so-called global war on terror. Um, would you advocate a sort of strong military approach or a more moderate approach? <laughs> <laughs> Well, for the next President of the United States, uh, her or him, um, I'd wish them well in the first place. But uh, I, I honestly believe in, in a conflict. Uh, it depends uh, wh where that c conflict is. 
uh, is it possible to negotiate? Is it possible uh, to uh, find a, a peaceful resolution? Are people going to listen to you? Um, I, my, my own experience, to, to be frank with you, is if, if you're dealing with people who are linked to criminality, if you're like, dealing with people who are just in it for you know, crime money, uh, you should never talk to them. You have to defeat them. If you're dealing with people who are ideologically driven, uh, who uh, passionately believe uh, that their, their homeland and uh, their whole psychic and their whole culture and tradition and history uh, is worth fighting and dying for, uh, you're not going to beat them. You talk about beating them, but you're not going to beat them. Um, I haven't seen that conflict yet. You can beat them in the short term. You can beat them for this generation, but they'll come back. And, um, you know, we have some experience in that in Ireland. Um, somebody tried to defeat us for 800 years, but... Um, <laughs> And ultimately, it ends up and people have to talk and as inevitably end up in a civil war. And, you know, but that's, that's not the, the best way of doing it. So I, I would always be, uh, unless you're dealing with a regime that are, are, that are just uh, off beat, um, but in, in any other circumstances, I, I would always be on the side of dialogue. Uh, I think it ultimately is a better way. Uh, hello Taoiseach, my name is Andrew Layden, I'm from County Clare and I'm currently studying at the law school here. Uh, the topic of the talk this evening is Ireland and the EU, so I thought I'd ask you about how you perceive Ireland's role in the EU. Uh, when we joined we were perhaps the poorest country in a much smaller union, now we're the second richest in a union of 27 with, with several new members which now occupy a position more like ours back when we joined. So I'm wondering, first of all, if you think whether our role within the EU has changed, and if so, what you think our role within the EU will be in future? Yeah, very soon we'll be a net contributor. Uh, my view on that is we should be very proud of that. Uh, when we joined, we were a long way short of the uh, EU average wealth, and now we're 47 points ahead of the EU average, or certainly if you take the... 27 in, it's about 30% if you take the, the, the old 15. Uh, so, you know, the days of what people might see as a gravy train from Europe, uh, you know, are, are over. But the vast majority of people understand uh, common agricultural policy and helping agriculture uh, to move forward is hugely important. And, and, and they, we will continue to get uh, substantial resources on, on, on the, uh, the CAP uh, fund. Uh, our role in the future, uh, as I said earlier on, if, if you're exporting 80% plus, in many areas 90% plus of your products, uh, then uh, our role has to be uh, very much part of an integrated Europe. Holding your identity but pooling uh, your sovereignty in some of the areas where subsidiarity is, is not the basis of, of the rules. Um, and in the end of the day, that's only a small amount of the areas anyway where you're pooling your sovereignty. In the rest of the areas, it's, it's your own national competence and the competence of the government and the parliament of the day. Uh, so um, for us, the way Ireland is heading now, uh, the, the four or five areas where the future and the future employment are, are uh, the biopharma, pharmaceutical, uh, medical technologies, medical appliances, uh, financial services. Uh, the food sector, the high quality food sector. We're no longer a cheap country, or we're no longer um, a lowly paid country. Uh, so therefore, it is making sure that everything we do uh, and doing in the context of, of the half a million or half a billion people that are in Europe, uh, that it is for us to, to be in that open and global market. Uh, and of course, keeping our, our huge contacts with the United States and the huge share in the market we have with the United States. And let's be frank about it, most of the United States companies that are in Ireland are not to supply Ireland, uh, it is to supply Europe and, and, and also supply other parts of the world. So I think that's the future for us. We, we can't be great in every sector. Um, some people might say we're great in no sector, but I'd say we're great in several sectors. Um, but we, we can't be great all over the place. You have to pick niche markets. Uh, at the end of the day, our labour force uh, will probably be about 3 million in 20 years' time. Uh, the Irish population uh, will be 7 million in 10, 12 years' time. Uh, we have about 3 million people we'll have to provide for. And I think we've cut the niche areas 
Um, but as you all know, uh, it, it, the world is changing all the time. The new products, new developments, new in, 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 we used to spend much money on innovation. We used to spend much money on research and development. We're spending eight billion now on research and development, just trying to keep ahead and to keep, to keep ourselves focused in the future. And that f focus has to be in the half a dozen areas I've mentioned um, for the next 10, 20 years. And with the changes in the innovation that will happen in those areas. And if we do that, uh, Ireland will continue uh, to be um, a, a country that will get more prosperous. I, Ireland isn't, we're not yet prosperous. So I'd like to be 100% ahead of the Irish average. But there, there are good opportunities for us to do that. Due to time constraints, we can take two more questions. So if you're there, and then up. Uh, good evening, Taoiseach. My name is Debbie Ellis. Um, I am an American citizen. And I'm in a relationship with a Irish citizen, and um, she is here on a work visa, and when her work visa expires, I, as current laws stand, I can't sponsor her as my partner, so we can't stay in the US, and as current laws stand, we can't go to Ireland either, but I understand your government has, is currently drafting legislation uh, for civil partnership and I was wondering if you think that this legislation will pass and if it will include immigration rights. The legislation uh, will pass, in, in my view. Um, the, the legislation uh, is a fair, it's a balanced legislation. Uh, it's in line with our constitution. Uh, and, and while inevitably, uh, as you know, um, uh, in same-sex relationship, it would create some problems, it would create some, some, some difficulties and, and some arguments, but uh, I think we're mature enough and advanced enough for the legislation um, in line with the two reports uh, that have been done recently, the, the Colley report and the Law Reform Commission report that it will pass. Uh, on most of the, the people coming into, in, into Ireland now, uh, on the job fronts, and many from the United States, not huge in overall terms, um, but the green card basis is, is, is the best basis uh, to be coming into, into an industry. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's not our, our, system, our, our system of immigration, uh, in, in my view, and particularly with the United States, because uh, I've been very clear on this. Uh, it is not possible for me to argue the case on the undocumented Irish or to get a, uh, an Australian type of visa for a young Irish uh, and for us not to be very sympathetic uh, to people in the United States coming to Ireland. Uh, and that's why we've uh, made a lot of changes in the last 12, 18 months in the green card system. And the green card system, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is not creating uh, difficulties for, for, for people. So uh, I do not think you should have a difficulty. Final question. Good evening. My name is Tom Gill. I'm a first year student in the Master of Public Policy program here. Uh, fourth generation Irish, and the most recently a uh, hotly debated issue at the Irish Catholic dinner table back home is immigration. Uh, and there's a strand of my family that says, especially Latino immigration, into the U.S. And the strand that says, you know, look, we have a lot in common with these people and we need to be very open um, to the undocumented immigrants that are coming into the country. And another strand that says, look, we've worked really hard for a number of years to get where we are and we want to protect that. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are for me as a fourth generation um, immigrant. Uh, and what you think should be sort of my framework for, for recognizing my history and where it is that I came from and, and my past and yet um, this current situation and a lot of the struggles that come with, with the immigration debate. The, I became quite an expert on uh, the immigration issue here and I know how sensitive it is and, and I know how difficult it is for, for the administration. Uh, I'd have to say we, we have spent a lot of years and I've probably spent the last six or seven years uh, d d directly talking to President Bush uh, on this issue and uh, what he has stated in his State of Union speech uh, is something that uh, we very much support. Uh, we do not expect um, the administration uh, to be able to say uh, everybody who came into the United States uh, illegally, whether they're Irish or elsewhere, uh, first of all we, do, we know you can't segregate these things, we know you can't get a separate deal for Irish or any other nationality. Um, and that it's all fine and it's all brushed aside. And, and I, I've got into some rows with the Irish groups here uh, because I said that, that kind of a thing is just not possible. And it's no good asking an administration to do something that's not possible or practical. What I believe is possible, but uh, is to 
um, create the circumstances and a process uh, where those that were illegally uh, here, and particularly, I'm talking particularly here uh, about people who are here a long time, uh, who are not able to go home to funerals, not able to go home to, um, you know, to, to the um, to the f family members that have died, or mothers, or fathers, or can't go home for weddings, and you know these issues. These create big problems for people. Uh, and now that Homeland Security are so much more active uh, and, and um, uh, so much better, and technology is catching up with people that didn't catch up with before, it's creating a real problem for them. But I, I think it is possible to create a condition uh, where these people can go through an administrative process and abide by uh, a legal system. Uh, that can get them uh, considered, uh, and, I, I, and I think we can do that. The, the idea of a blanket amnesty uh, is not going to happen. Um, I, I've, I've, t I've talked to uh, all sides on, on the aisle on this issue. Um, we're not talking about a big number of people, uh, and we're not looking for special pleading uh, for the Irish. We'd, we'd like to get special pleading for the Irish, but we're not going to get it. Um, but if, if we can get an arrangement where those that want to try and get the right side of the line will go through an administrative process uh, that will give them uh, a legal future here. Um, uh, that's the best that we're going to get, and we do think that's possible. And I'd, ha I'd have to say, um, uh, the President, in, to his credit, uh, has, has been very supportive in helping us to devise such a system. Uh, we almost had it through last year. Um, uh, John McCain and Edward Kennedy, as you know, had worked very closely on this, and then it blew up for, for reasons that are well documented. Um, uh, I hope on the other side of the presidency, the Irish government will be back um, again, and you know we we we, we don't uh, we don't mind him. We're, I'm totally apolitical about your election, as you know. But uh, the fact that Hillary Clinton has been a huge supporter of Ireland, uh, Barack Obama is from Offaly, the same <laughs> county, uh, and John McCain is a, a Scots Irish, so we can't go wrong. I just want to say on behalf of the Weatherhead Center and on behalf of the Institute of Politics, thank you so much for your frankness in speaking to the audience, your facility with the questions, your willingness to hit them head on. I wish more American politicians could do that. Um, thank you so much for your reflections on the past as well as your look into the future. Uh, I think most of all, though, thank you so much for the words of wisdom that you've shared with this audience today. Thank you so much.